better. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, you folks in the audience to help, uh, help out our speakers a little bit. How many people in the audience have already collaborated with the, uh, somebody in the proteomics group here? OK. How many of you who have not yet collaborated want to? OK. How many, how many people uh, don't work in a lab themselves but do informatics? And if you're currently a manager but you used to work in a lab, keep your hand down. P but people who, who uh, do just informatics. OK. All right. All right, so um, what I'm going to try to do here in the next 45 minutes is uh, cover the, the topics that are shown on the screen. I want to give you a flavor for the kind of information that is present in a mass spectrum. Um, not, so, not so much that you'll be able to go home and figure out spectra yourself, but that uh, in the event that you are already collaborating or you will, you will collaborate soon with somebody in the group, you have a flavor for how much information is there and what it takes to tease that information out. Okay. All right, so uh, I'm going to show uh, quite a few spectra as we uh, uh, work on this. Uh, for people who have worked on uh, uh, DNA, uh, T, C, G, and A do not stand for the things you think they do in proteomics. They stand for threonine, cysteine, glycine, and alanine uh, when you work on proteins and peptides. And there are 20 amino acids. Uh, the, the structures are shown here. Um, I have arranged them on this slide because I want to point out a few things as it pertains to how uh, they affect um, uh, behavior in the mass spectrometer. Okay? Uh, over here, uh, I'm listing all the masses of the individual amino acids. But they're, they're arranged by uh, some sort of property over here. Okay? From the mass spectrometry standpoint, uh, the amino acids shown down here are relatively boring uh, from the standpoint of, of causing fragmentation in the mass spectrometer. But I want to point out that leucine and isoleucine, you cannot distinguish them in the mass spectrometers that we use. They have the identical elemental composition, although the structure of the side chains is different. Uh, the most fascinating amino acid to, to, uh, from my, my standpoint is proline. Okay. It has the, the fact that the side chain is bound to the backbone uh, has a significant uh, impact on the way uh, peptides fragment in the mass spectrometer, and I'll point that out uh, a few slides later. Okay. Um, from the standpoint of ionization and fragmentation, probably the most important residues are lysine, histidine, and arginine, okay. because they all uh, contain uh, basic uh, side chains that can, uh, that can bear charge. But even amongst those three, uh, it's important to recognize that they have different uh, PKAs, okay, and that'll uh, and with arginine having the highest PKA, and that'll be, uh, become important in a, a few slides that I'll show you later about the fact that that PKA is so high, the arginine would uh, really like to hold on to that charge much more than so than the other uh, charge-bearing residues. Okay, uh, meanwhile, aspartic acid uh, and glutamic acid shown here have acidic side chains. Um, but we do almost all of the protein peptide mass spectrometry at low pH, okay? so they are not going to be negatively uh, charged. Uh, these three amino acids, uh, serine, threonine, and tyrosine, are particularly important be um, from um, a biology standpoint because they can become phosphorylated. And we're going to talk a lot about uh, phosphorylation uh, uh, today and tomorrow. All right, so let, uh, let's move on. Uh, cysteine, uh, if you are trying to memorize the masses, which I do I make people in the audience do when I teach a course, uh, on this. Uh, the mass of cysteine is 103, but that's a useless number uh, uh, to remember because we will almost always uh, be modifying the side chain chemically uh, before we do any mass spectrometry. And the most common thing to do, uh, as Steve mentioned earlier, is alkylate the side chain with iodocetamide. Okay. All right. Um, Steve already said a little bit about uh, fragmentation in the, the mass spectrometer. Uh, uh, the, after the next couple slides, you will never see individual chemical bonds anymore. They, they will all just be abstracted as single letter amino acids. Uh, but they are, in fact, uh, chemical molecules, and they have discrete uh, uh, bonds all along the peptide backbone. In a mass spectrometer, we do not measure mass. We put a charge on it in order to fragment by MSMS. The charge that's located on the molecule will uh, move around to different places uh, on the backbone. And the ba ba relative basicity of the different parts of the backbone is not the same all, all the way across the peptide. It depends on the, on the properties of the amino acids. When, when you look at a mass spectrum, you will often be, uh, think of it as a ladder, 
But I want to point out that when fragmentation happens, you don't get the, the same, the single molecule does not fragment as a ladder, okay? Instead, what happens is a, an individual molecule become protonated at, at one point, you'll uh, fragment, and if the charge stays over here, you get a B ion. If it fragments over here, you get a Y ion, okay? That's what happens with one um, molecule in the gas phase. When we measure mass spectrum, mass spectrum we're me measuring hundreds of thousands of those events, okay? Sometimes that fragmentation will happen here. Sometimes that fragmentation will happen here. Sometimes it'll happen over there. By measuring all of those things together, then we get a ladder of information, okay? Um, this is what uh, typically happens when you have uh, arginine, a number of uh, charges that equals the number of arginines, then the, uh, the charge will remain on the arginine side chain and you don't get fragmentation that happens here, okay? And when, when that does happen, you get very sparse fragmentation. I'll show that in a minute, okay? Uh, classically, we have nomenclature here where the most important ions you're gonna hear about again and again and again are B and Y ions, and that represents this bond. The reason they're called B and Y is because there's actually three different types of bonds. Uh, the other two tend to be less important in terms of their ability to fragment, uh, and those um, labels are nominally A, B, and C ions, as well as X, Y, and Z, okay? But it's still not quite that simple, okay? Each one of the amino acids has a, a side chain on it, okay? Some of those chi side chains can also undergo fragmentation in the side chain. So you can lose ammonia or water. Uh, if there is water or ammonia present in the side chain, certain residues have that. Uh, if you have a phosphorylated uh, residue, you can also lose phosphoric acid from the side chain, okay? All right. Um, most of what we're going to talk about now today is B and Y ions, but it is actually possible using a technique called electron transfer dissociation to produce C and Z type ions, and we'll see a little bit about that. Okay. In, in the case where you can get multiple fragmentations of, the, of a single ionized species, you can actually get composition information. Okay. So if you fragment here and here of a single ion, you isolate this piece right here, and that's referred to as an ammonium ion. Okay. Since it contains the side chain, we can get some composition information, and the, uh, the masses of the various uh, ammonium ions for the different amino acids are shown here. Okay? The ones in green are the ones that are easily uh, observable on the most common instrumentation that we use. The ones in black, you have to have more specialized instrumentation that we don't uh, use here. Okay? Uh, it's important to, to remember when you see these ions that we can't tell you. Uh, when, if, for example, you see a 110 ion, that means that there's histidine present in the peptide. We don't know how many histidines, okay? So we get composition, but not stoichiometric information from these types of ions. All right, this is what a spectrum looks like when it uh, comes off the mass spectrometer. It's just a black bar chart with mass labels, okay? Uh, software goes and interprets that. Uh, you're gonna see a bunch of uh, spectra here in the next several slides, I wanna point out a few, few things, okay? The mass axis is M over Z. You, these are MSMS spectra. The precursor ion measurement is uh, show, is uh, positioned there where that little carrot is. Uh, the charge of the peptide is shown over here, and the precursor uh, in its singly charged form is here, and the multiply charged form is here. Okay, so this mass 941 corresponds to the position of that carrot. Okay, all right, so when you see a spectrum like that, um, what can you determine from that spectrum? Anybody? Okay. If you do some simple math, you can uh, look at the difference between those uh, peaks and you can see 128 and 99. If you go uh, to the other side, you see the same 99 and 128, okay? When this particular peptide has fallen apart, it's only fallen apart in a couple of places and we get redundant information. We get uh, B type information and Y ion type information, okay? If you uh, search this spectrum against the database, you get this answer. Uh, as the, um, the best uh, peptide that fits that spectrum, okay? Um, when when I, you see a sequence shown here, if there's a blue slash, that means there's a B-type ion uh, be, uh, formed between those residues. A red slash means there's a Y-type ion there, and a pink slash means you got both of them, okay? So what you can see here is that there's uh, uh, support for the glutamine and the valine position in the sequence. There are more slashes than that, and that is due to the fact that uh, if, in fact, you blow up the spectrum, there is more information that's down uh, at lower abundance, okay? 
that is uh, uh, above the noise level in the spectrum. Okay, so that, that's one example. Here's an example of where I like to think of this as being something that anybody in the audience should be able to figure out the sequence of this, okay? Because you can look at that spectrum and you can see uh, complementary ion uh, pairs that together add up to the precursor mass. If you start to do some simple math, uh, you can write down uh, these masses. My seven-year-old daughter can translate that into sequence. Okay? I write little secret messages to her, uh, and she ha has a cheat sheet of amino acid masses, and she can say, who, who doesn't believe me? <laughs> no? <laughs> okay, all right. Um, 163, tyrosine, tyrosine. Uh, 113, you can't tell whether that's leucine or uh, isoleucine. Uh, 71, which is alanine. Uh, threonine is 101. Uh, 115 uh, is aspartic acid, okay? The same uh, sequence information goes in reverse, okay? At the, in this case, I have labeled uh, th these things in blue and these things in uh, red, which uh, suggests that I, I know that they are the B ions and the Y ions. But from what we've shown so far, you can't actually tell whether they were the N-terminal ones or the C-terminal ones. So you could, in fact, read that sequence either way, okay? All right, uh, when you search a, 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 the spectrum against a database, you come up with this as the best matching uh, peptide, okay? And you can see that there's fragmentation um, nearly end-to-end, -end, but in this case, there, there's still, there's no fragmentation between the alanine and the gl uh, glutamic acid there. So we, if we're just trying to figure out the sequence just from the spectrum alone, we can't tell the order of A and E, and here we can't tell the order of uh, cysteine and alanine. Okay. Yeah. When you said between with the two, okay, okay, okay. Hold on. So that that's not two different spectrum. Okay. That's this is the same thing top and bottom. This is just what comes out of the instrument. This is what comes out of the software package. Okay. Okay, all right. So the slide previous, that's a completely different peptide. All right? That peptide, this is an example of a peptide that, that fall, fragments to give you partial sequence information. Okay? This is an example where you get nearly complete sequence information. Okay? Uh, if you were to uh, take a, a, a protein and digest it up into its peptides, or you take a complex mixture and digest it up into peptides, you're going to get a range of different um, fragmentation completeness. Okay. What I'm trying to, to, to show you here is the range of completeness that you'll get in the data. Okay. All right, so, um, so what I've already now tried to show you is that the sequence information in a typical uh, mass spectrum is not uh, complete. How much does it matter? Okay. This is a figure that I created when I was in graduate school, uh, and I, created, I was in graduate school long enough ago that this was before the genome was done. Okay. This was even before Solera was a company. Okay. Um, and I wanted, and, but there was still sequence in the database. We actually used to clone genes one at a time back then, right? And so there was a database that contained known gene sequences that you could translate in protein. Uh, and we could collect mass spectra and do the kind of identification that we're talking about today. But what I wanted to know was, are we still going to be able to do this when the genome is done? Okay. And if we weren't going to be able to, then I should probably choose a different career. I kept going with the career, so the good news is that uh, we can still do this today. All right, so what does the figure mean? Okay, um, the, the, the y-axis is a logarithmic scale, and it counts the total number of peptides that I am um, graphing under the following conditions. The x-axis is the length of the peptide, okay? All right, so the first line that I want to point out, this, is, this blue line represents all sequences in the human genome, okay? So there are about 10 to the 7th. Um, peptides between 10 and the 7th, 10 to the 6th, uh, different peptides, if you restrict yourself just to the sequences in the human genome, okay? And at the time I made this slide, we didn't know how big the genome was, and one estimate was that it was about uh, 100,000 genes, okay? All right, so that's what would happen if you restrict to just peptides present in the genome of, the, of humans, okay? And I'm referring to the coding portion, okay? All right, now instead, if we, if we make the, a line that plots all possible sequences, given all the permutations of 20 amino acids, you get this red line, okay? If you knew no sequence information at all, but you did know amino acid composition, you get the green line, okay? All right, so the simple message now here is where these lines cross, okay? 
what this, the fact that the red and blue cross here tells you that if your peptide length is six, all po possible permutations of six amino acids exist somewhere as a peptide in the a human proteome. By the time you get out to length 11, if you had only the amino acid composition, there might be a single sequence that was, uh, had that composition. Okay? So the message now is that you don't have to have complete sequence in order to get a unique answer for a peptide that belongs to a protein in the human uh, proteome. All right. So here's an example now where you have very little information. Okay? This happens to be a, a spectrum where you get a very dominant cleavage at the uh, proline position uh, in the spectrum. And if you look uh, from just an information content uh, uh, view, you can determine that the, there's some mass separations here that correspond to proline, serine, uh, and then this uh, um, 28 Dalton separation is characteristic of a B2A2 ion pair. Okay? But then you have this big peak right here. When you search that data against uh, a database, the best answer that comes up uh, is shown here. And what you have is a, a very significant cleavage between the phenylalanine and the proline. So when you have a proline in a sequence, uh, it's uh, very common for uh, that to represent one of the tallest ions in the, in the spectrum. Okay? The, the, the side chain of the proline wants to be bound uh, to the uh, backbone. It's a site that's easy to protonate when uh, uh, a proton is moving around along the uh, backbone, and then you get a very facile cleavage there. Okay? Uh, here's a case where you get uh, very little fragmentation, uh, and this is the information that you can get just from uh, trying to figure it out all by hand. Okay? Uh, this is a case where you have two arginines uh, in the peptide, and you have only two charges on the peptide. So those charges in the gas phase really want to stay on the arginines, and you only get cleavage after uh, acidic residues. Okay. All right. Um, uh, it gets a little more complicated uh, in this example. This example, you, you, when you just look at the number of peaks in that spectrum, there seems to be quite a bit more than anything I've shown you. When you look in uh, greater detail, you start to see that there are a whole bunch of these things that are separated by uh, uh, 18 uh, Daltons. That's the mass of water. Uh, I like to refer to this as a crybaby spectrum. Okay. Uh, you, it's very typical to get this kind of behavior when you have glutamic acid uh, at the C-terminus. Okay. All right. What I have just uh, shown you now are, uh, uh, previously, are, are uh, peptides fragmented on a, a particular instrument. And that was the kind of instrument that we had uh, a half a dozen of uh, a few years ago. Now we're down to only a couple. Uh, now we have uh, the, the most complex instrument in the lab uh, is, is shown up here. It's called an uh, thermo orbitrap elite. It can fragment a peptide three different ways. Okay? It can fragment it by a technique called collision-induced dissociation. It can fragment it by higher energy collision dissociation, or it can uh, fragment it by electron transfer dissociation. Uh, these all happen at different places in the instrument. To orient you a little bit, uh, the ions come into the mass spectrometer here in the source. They get analy mass analyzed here in the orbitrap. Okay? If we fragment uh, uh, here, we can do collision-induced association. If we introduce negative ions into this part of the instrument uh, and combine them over here, uh, we can do electron transfer dissociation. If we do uh, collide them over here, we can do something called HCD. Okay? These all happen uh, at different uh, ion energies. And as a result, if you fragmented the same peptide the three different ways, the spectra will look um, quite a bit different, and I'll show you that uh, in a minute. Okay? Most of the uh, um, fragmentation that we were doing a few years ago was by this technique. Now we have a fleet of instruments where we're pre pre uh, predominantly doing this technique. Okay? Uh, and then uh, in uh, so more isolated cases, we use this uh, electron transfer dissociation technique. Okay? All right, so now I'm going to show you several spectra in a row where it's the same peptide being fragmented by different techniques. And what I'm trying to do here is show you that you get uh, substantially different uh, uh, fragmentation. Okay? The intensities are going to be different, uh, as well as uh, some of the ion types that you observed. And in each case, you can see the extent of fragmentation that you get uh, shown up here. Okay? Uh, of the three, the, the slides I'm going to show you, it's the same. CID, HCD, and uh, ETD on the top uh, in order. Okay? One of the things I want to point out here with the uh, HCD now is that we get the low mass end of the spectrum. And the techniques that we were primarily doing a few years ago, we don't get that. Being able to observe the low mass region is going to be particularly important uh, later today when you hear about uh, quantitation by a technique called ITRAC. Okay? Uh, 
All right. Uh, in this case, when you have a doubly charged precursor, the electron transfer dissociation uh, is probably the, the least effective of the three. When you have a triply charged precursor, uh, the ETD becomes uh, substantially more uh, effective. And even between these, these two different techniques, what you see is that uh, you're much more likely to get multiply charged fragment ions using CID than you are uh, by using HCD. Okay. By the time you get to um, higher charges, the uh, ETD uh, works very well. Uh, the CID works uh, less well. Okay. Most of the time that we're working on peptides, especially triptych peptides, the predominant charge state that we're going to observe is um, doubly charged and triply charged. Okay. All right, so that's a, a, a bit about how peptides fragment. There are some things that make it a bit tricky. What I hope I've conveyed to you so far now is that you get um, quite often incomplete fragmentation. The intensity of the fragment ions can vary uh, quite a bit depending upon the um, sequence of the peptide and the composition of amino acids that contribute to it. I've already mentioned that leucine and isoleucine, can't, you can't tell the difference. They have the same elemental composition. Okay. There are also pairs of amino acids uh, that together add up to uh, another amino acid. Okay. Now let's uh, look at spectra in, in the sense of how do you figure out where a phosphorylation site is. Okay. By mass, we can, uh, we, have, we can measure a mass that will be consistent with a, a sequence shown here plus one phosphate, okay? Phosphate uh, has an additional mass of 80 Daltons, right? Uh, and then in this sequence, there are uh, several amino acids that can hold phosphate, okay? There's a, uh, three threonines and two serines. What I've shown here now is the same spectrum labeled with two different possible places to put the phosphate, okay? Up here, it could be on the serine, or down here, it could be in the threonine. In each case, you would label the spectrum to look as shown here. The main difference is this ion is well explained as a Y7, which is the cleavage between the serine and the threonine here, if the serine is phosphorylated. If the threonine were phosphorylated, as shown down here, that peak uh, is left unexplained. Okay? And you don't have evidence of fragmentation between the serine and the threonine. Okay? So in this case, it's pretty easy to locate the uh, phosphate to that position. Okay. On this slide, what I'm showing you is the range of possibilities that we have when we're trying to uh, assign the position of phosphorylation. Okay. Uh, the top case is easy. You don't even have to have any fragmentation at all to figure out where uh, the phosphate is because there's only one amino acid in the peptide that can, that can hold that phosphate. Uh, in this case, it's the serine. Okay. So we can easily conclude, once we've measured the, the mass, that the, that the phosphate has to be on the serine. Okay. Then you get down to, if we have a single phosphorylation site, and we had to be able to tell the difference between these two peptides, we would need fragmentation that was between the S and the L, or fragmentation between the L and the T, to be able to isolate the position of that phosphate. In this case, you have uh, three different serines out here that could hold the phosphate, and so we would need fragmentation between the first and second, the second or the second and third, and able, uh, and able to localize that phosphate. Okay. And this is a much more complicated example where, by mass, we could tell that we have two phosphates. And now we have to uh, uh, look at all the possibilities of where you could put those phosphates uh, and then see if uh, the fragmentation information in the spectrum can tell the difference. Okay. Uh, and in, in this case, what I'm suggesting here is that the uh, information in the spectrum would be able to confidently place one phosphate on that serine there. But there's not enough information to tell which one of those two serines would hold the phosphate. Okay. So now let's take a look at the spectra that illustrate those cases. Okay. This is one where uh, we're looking for fragmentation between the S and the L or T uh, to be able to confidently assign the position of that serine. Okay. Um, so here's the serine. You can see then we have a, a Y ion there and a Y ion there that allows us to locate the serine as the position of phosphate. Okay. Here's the case where we have three serines um, at the uh, and terminus of the, of the peptide. Okay, the three serines are shown here, and there's a nice ion that illustrates fragmentation between the second and the third. But there's no ion that tells us between the first two. Okay, so we don't know whether where we have uh, the phosphate in this case it has to be on one of the first two serines. Okay, this is the case where you can confidently assign it to this serine, 
this is the position in the sequence here. We have nice fragmentation between the serine and the isoleucine and between the serine and the proline. Okay. Uh, but over here, we don't have very good fragmentation between uh, that serine and that serine. Okay, so we can't tell where, the, where that serine is at. Okay. All right. So that's the information that's present in the spectra. Now let's talk a little bit about what the software has to do to grind up uh, the information and spit it out to you. And most of what I'm going to talk about now applies to the type of experiment that's being described here. We would separate peptides uh, by liquid chromatography. They come out uh, over a period of time. If you uh, take a slice out of that period of time, you can get an MS spectrum. Imagine this is a slice out of the plane of the time. We measure the masses of the peptides. Uh, and then we do MS-MS. And if we do, were to focus on just one particular uh, precursor ion, imagine taking a, a slice out of the plane of the board, you get a spectrum that is an MSMS spectrum. Okay? At the time I made the slide several years ago, the instruments were fast enough in three seconds to measure one MS scan and uh, eight MSMSs. Okay? Now, Heidi may remember years ago when uh, we were working at Millennium, um, we had even slower uh, instruments, and you could only do three or four in that time span. Now, we can easily do 20 spectra in that time span. Um, the picture shown up here, these are low resolution spectra. Now we can do 20 in that time span, and they can get their high resolution spectra. Okay? All right. The software that uh, uh, interprets the spectra has to do the following things. You start with a bunch of mass spectra. You're going to pull the spectra out, uh, and you're going to do some, uh, calculate some statistics on them that will later be used for quantitation. The spectra themselves get sent into a search engine. The search engine's role is to match the spectrum to a peptide to give you a peptide identification. And it's typically going to do that for every spectrum that you send into the software program. Okay? Some of the answers are going to come out right. Some of them are going to come out incorrect. So we want to get to, we're going to use another program that will then determine the false discovery right and, and assign quant, uh, confident identification to some subset of the spectra that we've generated. Most of the time when we do a proteomics experiment, we're not interested in the uh, information at the level of peptides. We're more interested in it at the level of proteins. Okay? So we're going to put all that peptide information back together, and you'll uh, end up with some sort of list of proteins that have been measured in this experiment. Uh, typically, we're going to do some quantitation involved to tell you what's up and down regulated between the two uh, states that you're comparing, um, or more states if, uh, if the experiment uh, does that. Okay? For phosphopeptide um, experiments, where we're doing phosphoproteomic experiments, we, we, instead of looking at the data at the peptide or protein level, we may want it uh, organized uh, at the, uh, the phosphorylation site level. Okay? So the software is then going to put together the information to reduce it just to information at the level of sites. Okay? So now what I'm going to do is uh, spend a little bit of time talking about how this program works, how, how the program works it gets to this stage, and then how the program works it gets to that stage, and I'm going to talk about how the program works to get to that stage. All right? All right. So this is about scoring. Okay? Um, what's shown on the top? is a complete spectrum. Um, what's shown on the bottom is the spectrum, that, the, the processed version of the spectrum that goes into the program. Okay? So uh, uh, it's going to do some peak detection. It's going to do de-isotoping. That's something that Steve mentioned. We're going to reduce to just the C12 isotopes. Uh, we are going to remove the region around the precursor ion that does not contain sequence information. Uh, to the extent that we can, we'll assign uh, charge to the different fragment ions. And then we're going to take that information and match it to a, a database uh, sequence candidate. Okay? The scoring that uh, gets done in SpectraMill has these uh, particular attributes. You get a, a bonus portion that is uh, dependent upon the ion type. Okay? Uh, typically, a B ion and a Y ion are worth one point. A B minus water or B minus phosphate ion uh, has not as much information because you already uh, would typically have a B or Y ion, so that gets worth uh, half a point. Okay. So uh, it's shown down here are the, the different values that you get for each peak in the spectrum. Okay. So the score is shown here. All right. uh, green peaks in these spectra, those are uh, peaks that are labeled because they have uh, amino acid composition information but not sequence information. Okay. So in this case, that's a loss of phosphate ion. You get a, um, a bonus that is uh, just for the... Uh, 
uh, for the marker ion associated with phosphate. Now, one of the things that spectrum also does is give you a penalty for peaks in the spectrum that are unexplained. Okay? If the largest peak in the spectrum was unexplained, you'd lose one. If the height of the, of the peak that's unexplained is half the height of the tallest one, you lose a half. So little noise peaks that are unexplained, you, you lose very small amounts. Okay? So when you see a score that comes out of this particular program, it's easy to take that number and translate it back into how much fragmentation of the peptide there was. Okay? The highest score is, is typically 25, because that's the maximum number of peaks that uh, get sent into the program. So that if there's a score of 25, that means there was 25 bond cleavages along the peptide backbone uh, that led to that spectrum. Okay? If there was only a score was four, it means there was only four bonds uh, along that peptide backbone that were cleaved. Okay? Uh, so we also track a number called the scored peak intensity. In this case, it's 92%. That means only 8% of the intensity in the spectrum was unexplained. All right, when uh, doing localization of phosphates, what we do is take and apply that scoring system to all the different possible positionings of uh, phosphates among the residues that can bear it, and then we look at the difference between those two, okay? So uh, what I typically do then now is I set a score threshold of 1.1, okay? What that means is that you can have confident uh, localization if you, you have a value of 1.1. That means you have a, at least one peak in the spectrum that is of a B or Y ion type, so score one, okay? Uh, and when uh, what the 1.1 portion of that uh, comes from the fact that the scoring ion that gives you that gap has to be at least 10% of the base peak of, uh, in the spectrum. So it has to be a peak of reasonable intensity, okay? Right? This is another way of scoring it that is uh, probably actually the most common uh, program in use um, our scoring system in, in use today in the proteomics field for looking at um, phosphorylation site localization is something called A-score. Uh, it comes from a lab uh, across the uh, river, uh, Steve Gigi's lab uh, over at Harvard. Uh, the core uh, component of the scoring is the binomial distribution uh, that's shown here. Okay? And then what you have to do is take the mass spectrometry fragmentation problem and squeeze it into a binomial distribution problem. Okay? Uh, the key way that they do that is, uh, for the purpose of phospholocalization, is to look at just the p positions along the peptide backbone that could be used to distinguish two possible places for phosphate. In this case, it would be the serine here and the threonine there. And you count how many um, uh, ions you could produce that would give that information. In this case, uh, there are six possible uh, ions. Okay? Then what you, and you use that to plug in as a value in the, um, uh, in the equation here. Then what you also do is you say, we're going to allow for six peaks per 100 Daltons of spectrum to be used, and we're going to allow for a fragment mass tolerance of plus or minus a half a Dalton. Okay? You plug those numbers in, and you get a score. Then you, and you do this, uh, and you look at the differences, and the, um, um, the difference will then be used to give you a score. Okay? Uh, uh, if you look at the various numbers that come out of this program and the uh, thresholds that are typically used, um, it takes two ions to, to be something that confidently calls the location of the phosphate. Okay. This, this same binomial um, scoring um, ar arrangement was, uh, has been uh, used for the scoring system. Another program that's uh, something we commonly use here uh, at the Broad is a program called Andromeda, which is part of the MaxQuant package. You have the same uh, core uh, equation uh, that's shown here. Uh, there's a few different uh, uh, differences that are, that are done here. So when we're just scoring for peptide identification, not just for site localization, all of the possible peptide um, BNY ions formed everywhere on the backbone are allowed for. And then they also allow for uh, certain fragment ion types, as shown here. So you can lose water if you have uh, those amino acids present, similar to what I do. Okay. But when you try to put it into this equation, you're forced now to give those B and Y ions the same, the same score value as the neutral loss ion types. Okay. The uh, equation, again, uh, re essentially requires that you have a fixed mass tolerance of plus or minus a half a Dalton. Okay. Then what this um, program does is it does a couple of steps of optimization. It, uh, allow it calculates the maximum possible score uh, with different numbers of peaks um, taken out of the spectrum, okay? 
and it will calculate the score uh, with and without these uh, neutral loss ion types. Okay? So you have a, a core probability that's being used, but at the end of the day, you're not completely accurate because of the following uh, assumptions that you've done uh, to squeeze the mass spectrometry problem into the binomial uh, distribution. Okay? Uh, this, uh, these are the uh, assumptions that are shown here. Okay? All right, so at the end of the day, Although this is a probability scoring system, it's really what it is is probability based. Okay, so you don't get a number out that uh, is an accurate reflection of the probability that your uh, interpretation is correct. Instead, what you get is a score, and yes, that score is an effective score. Okay, all right. If we think now in terms of uh, scoring, not just identification but localization, what I've tried to show here are the key, what I think are the key aspects of scoring localization. Okay. So to some degree, anybody's program has to do these things. And how well it does these things uh, is uh, perhaps a little more important than uh, what, what the details of the score do. Okay? Peak detection is very key. And when you have ambiguity or uncertainty in the localization of, the, of a site, how, how clearly you indicate that uh, is what differentiates some of these uh, programs. Okay? In the field of proteomics today, we don't have a good independent measure for localization that you can compare across programs. Okay? I told you with SpectraMail the, the threshold for our certainty is a score difference of 1.1. Okay? If you use a score, the A score program, the uh, score threshold is either 19 or 15, depending upon uh, how conservative or liberal you want to be. But we don't have a number today that allows you to say, oh, I want it to this level of certainty no matter whose program I'm using, and all, we all would understand that number, okay? Yeah? Just to make sure I understand what you're saying, you don't, you don't have a good way of calculating the probability of whether, you know, whether we've localized this possibility to this point as well. Right, okay. yeah, okay. We do, however, have a good metric for, de for deciding whether the identification is correct or not. Oh, the okay. Most okay, say that again? It's, it's more that we can tell how many we typically have wrong in a data set or typically have right, okay? So that's what I'm going to start to talk about now, okay? All right. When, so why could you get the answer wrong, okay? What I've tried to say earlier uh, is that uh, even with only a handful of peaks in the spectrum, you should be able to get, pull the right answer out of the database, okay? All right. Well, that's, that's major reason number one why you might not get the right, data, the right answer. If the, if the peptide you're after is not in the database, okay? Um, when you have told the program to go and search, you typically tell it uh, a species, okay? Uh, and there would be some sort of reference genome uh, that you would uh, use, okay? Uh, nowadays, we're starting to be able to use RNA-seq data uh, and other uh, whole genome sequencing data or exome sequencing data to create a personalized database that uh, is um, re a reflection of the proteome of that particular patient's sample, okay? But more traditionally, we start out with a reference uh, uh, genome or proteome. If you have a single mutation uh, in a particular peptide that you're looking at, you uh, are typically not likely to match that spectrum, okay? Um, some of the things that uh, Steve mentioned and Monica will probably tell you a little bit more about, uh, in the sample processing of your uh, sample, if you don't, al if you don't uh, allow for the search engine to know about the possible chemical modifications that can take place along the way, uh, you will be uh, uh, unable to match those particular spectra, okay? Uh, uh, Steve mentioned that we're going to use an enzyme, typically uh, trypsin, coupled with Lyc. Uh, if there is nonspecific cleavage and you didn't allow for that uh, in the database search program, then those spectra will also not be matched, okay? And then, of course, we hope that after you've completed the two days of the course and you are doing some of this yourself, this would never be a problem, okay? User competence. All right. Score thresholds, okay? Uh, and uh, the metric that uh, we told you we, we have is something called false discovery rate or FDR. Uh, before FDR was uh, developed, um, this is what you would do. You would use some, some particular program and you would say, oh, I want my, I'm only gonna take the data above a particular uh, score and that one, we're, uh, everything above that we're gonna consider to be correct and everything that below that we're gonna say we're not so confident, we'll uh, reject that, okay? Then of course you get to the problem of uh, across our field, if you're using different programs, you don't necessarily are, are not able to look at somebody else's results and tell and decide whether they were uh, very liberal or very conservative in their assignments of what uh, was a quality score. 
okay? And there was uh, then no metric that would tell you about the error rates that you had in your data set, okay? Now what we have are uh, the ability uh, to calculate false discovery rates. Almost everybody in proteomics has, uh, is doing this. If you have interacted with somebody and they don't tell you what the FDR was on their data set, uh, as they give you results, you should find another collaborator, okay? All right, typically what we, we tend to do is we, we'll, we'll look for an FDR on the order of 1%, okay? In, in uh, proteomics field, there's two basic ways of doing uh, this today. Uh, one is called a target decoy approach, and the other one are, uh, there are various flavors of Bayesian uh, methods. Uh, the target de decoy is the most widely used, and that's what I'm going to talk about uh, in detail here today, okay? Uh, and the idea is uh, shown here, and that is that you're going to basically provide a decoy database to match your spectra to, and if you have done that well, it should be the case that you can only get the correct match in the target portion of the database, and incorrect matches uh, could come from uh, the decoy portion as well as the target portion, okay? When you start talking about this, it, it, it amazes me that uh, informatics, uh, informaticians, mathematicians always want to start talking about, how about if we just make a random database, okay? Um, some people do this. It's not as easy to get the characteristics that you'd like, okay? One of the, um, uh, the, the characteristics that you'd like are shown up here. And one uh, key aspect is that you'd like to have a 50-50 chance uh, that a uh, spectrum would match to either the target or decoy portion of the database. So you want the same number of peptides uh, in the database. If you're going to shuffle uh, the positions of the amino acids, what happens is you lose the um, uh, protein homology that might be present, okay? And so that's illustrated right here. Uh, in one protein, you might have this sequence right here. Another protein, you'd have this sequence right here. Okay. If all you did was reverse the sequences, the positions of the arginine and lysine residues that for which you're going to digest with trypsin will stay uh, intact. And when you digest them, uh, in this case, you would get this peptide from each one of them okay, that's the same. Okay. So there's only three distinct peptides that result uh, from that cleavage. Okay. If you've done the shuffling, then you end up with five uh, after you've shuffled. Okay. So what happens here is then you get uh, a much larger pool of uh, incorrect uh, possible peptides to match to when you do this, okay? So what we tend to do most widely in the field is this, shown here as the target decoy, okay? So if you take all of your spectra, you search it against the tar uh, a concatenated database of target and uh, decoys, uh, you take all the results after you get them out, sort them in descending uh, score order, you might actually have a couple of different scores from a particular search engine, you need to combine them uh, and do that uh, sorting. You count the number of uh, target hits above the uh, score threshold, you count the uh, decoy hits above a particular threshold, and you calculate the false discovery rate, which is shown right here, okay? And then, ideally, you would uh, have chosen that uh, target score threshold such that it will meet a particular false discovery rate. Typically, uh, it'll be something, uh, something like 1%. If you read a, pep, uh, a proteomics paper and they use uh, an FDR of 5%, two things should occur to you. One, these guys are sloppy, okay? The second thing is maybe they have a good reason for being sloppy. And so if they, uh, if they have a, a FDR that's higher than 1%, there will be some, typically some sort of statement that uh, justifies why they're uh, loosening it up like that, okay? <coughs> all right. After we have interpreted that, um, all that mass spectra data to a list of peptides, we're only partway there because we're doing a proteomics experiment typically, and what we want to know is information about the proteins that were present in the sample, okay? So we have to take uh, the peptides and put them back together uh, to, to uh, form proteins. And this is done in uh, conjunction with a reference sequence database, okay? All right, but, but uh, I've already told you that if you had a peptide of amino acid length six, that, was gonna, that might be in multiple uh, proteins, okay? And uh, certainly you recognize that uh, uh, even when you have a longer sequence, it might be part of a domain that is conserved across multiple proteins, okay? So what, it, the, what this slide does is illustrates the various possibilities, okay? The, in all the cases, we're going to say we have four different uh, peptides that we've observed. Um, if you have this condition where uh, a protein A has two of them, protein B has the other two, then we clearly know that we have two distinct proteins, okay? 
Uh, if we have uh, all four peptides contained in two uh, different proteins, uh, protein A and B, we can't tell the difference between uh, which protein we have present in our sample. Okay. Uh, here's a, a, a fairly <coughs> tricky case. Because the peptide number one is only in protein A, we know we have protein A present in the sample. Peptide number four is only present in C, so we know we have protein C present in the sample. But all the peptides that contribute to, to B could be explained by either A or C. So protein B, we typically assume, is not present in the sample because all of the data can be more simply explained by the presence of only A and C. Okay. Uh, these are a, a few other cases that are, uh, <coughs> should start to look sort of obvious. Uh, in this case, what you have is uh, protein B is probably a shorter, shortened version of protein A, but because we have uh, found this particular peptide, we know that protein A must be present in the sample, and we will then assume that protein B is not in the sample because we can uh, explain all of our data just with the presence of protein A. Okay. All right. Now, that's, that's how it looks like in the abstract. Let's talk about uh, what it means uh, in the specific. Uh, but before I go on, I'll say that anytime we uh, make any one of these decisions, typically we're going to use a, a peptide that is longer than eight amino acids. Okay. All right. Uh, Here's a screenshot that shows you uh, an example uh, report that would come out of the Spectrum Mill software package. Uh, this is uh, sample A, or, or sample 1, compared to sample 2. In this case, it's a wild type versus the mutant version of a Polobox uh, binding domain. Each row in the uh, table corresponds to uh, the, no the proteins that are present in the sample, uh, and the boxes tell you how many spectra were present, and then this is the total abundance of the precursor ions for all the peptides. Okay. Uh, then protein grouping is done such that uh, in, shown in red here are three different uh, protein <coughs> groups, uh, and they have two, uh, two subgroup members, three subgroup members, two subgroup members there. Okay? So uh, when this numbering uh, is done, the, the, the numbers are put together. This is num group number 530.1.2. The numbering is done to indicate that there is some degree of shared peptides present, but there's also unique information uh, for the one that's shown here, in this case, it's uh, dehydrogenase A, dehydrogenase B. Okay, so that that numbering preserves the relationship uh, of those two uh, um, protein sequences. Okay, uh, when you look at things at the peptide level, now this has shown uh, all of the sequences in the database that are part of group one. This shows all of the um, protein sequences that are part of group two, and then there's an alignment here. Uh, the uh, coloring shows you uh, where peptides that were observed in the proteomic experiment. Okay? Uh, in this case, you see every, every one of these sequences contains this yellow peptide, and every one contains this blue and orange set. Okay? So those, uh, those two peptides are responsible for the grouping being created. Okay? Then the other ones where you don't have it top to bottom uh, start to be peptides that uniquely provide evidence uh, for the two different uh, groups of proteins that are present here. Okay? This happens to be a, a piece of the software that, that Jake uh, uh, put together a couple of years ago and helps us to really understand uh, what's going on, okay? So you get this kind of uh, uh, ability to uh, tell that there are multiple forms of uh, different uh, of proteins that are related. Uh, the most common uh, occurrence of this is when you have isoforms uh, of, a, of a particular protein. Uh, it can also affect you if you've done a more complicated experiment, like something I've done with, uh, with Alexandra over the past couple of years where we're doing a xenograft experiment. We will take um, human uh, tumor cells, put them into a mouse. They grow a tumor. We take the tumor out, and we uh, analyze it, and we have some peptides that are human and some peptides that are mouse, okay? So when we search a database that combines both the human and mouse uh, uh, version of the proteome, uh, and this particular uh, protein shown here is fibrillin, there would be 14 peptides that are the, uh, indistinguishable. They have the same sequence between human and mouse. Okay, those would be the peptides that are shown in yellow. Obviously, there are not 14 of them here. That's because this uh, protein is very large, and this takes more than one screen to show the complete sequence. Okay, all right. But if we wanted to know what was the relative abundance of things that are derived from the tumor and versus relative abundance of things derived from the stroma, we want to keep track of the individual peptides that uniquely correspond to human and uniquely correspond to mouse. Okay, those are shown in pink and uh, uh, purple, respectively. In this particular case, the abundance is fairly similar, so we conclu conclude that uh, this protein uh, is made both by the tumor 
uh, and the stroma, uh, and we do, um, but these are all uh, peptides that have distinct sequence, and as was mentioned earlier, they're not necessarily uh, going to ionize the same way uh, to give you a concentration-specific information, so we use a relatively loose set of uh, thresholds when we make this distinction between uh, being derived from stro stroma or, or tumor, okay? All right, so I'm going to uh, stop there. And I've, what I've tried to do is cover identification of spectra, tell you what information is present, talk about how the scoring is done from a peptide spectrum match, uh, talk about fault discovery rates and how you put things back to, together for proteins. Uh, in greater detail are listed some references that uh, you can follow up on that if you like. And if there are any other questions, I'd be happy to take them now.